Thank you all for coming to listen. Um, yeah, my name is Tim Sisson, um, Managing Director of William Morfitt Limited. We are um, a long-standing, long-running British company going back 65 years, and over that time we've been involved in draining a lot of land. Um, we're lucky enough to, to work for some of the leading names in British agriculture today, and James is one of our clients, uh, so we've done a lot of work for James on various uh, fields that he's farming round and about. Um, I think it's. I think it's. Uh, we had a lot this morning about efficiency and uh, driving production and so on. And it's probably quite nice to get back to talking about where it all starts, which is uh, soil and being the very bedrock and foundation of what we're all trying to grow crops within. And um, in a show where there's all kinds of very clever and big machines, it's really worth remembering that what's beneath our feet is uh, is the starting point to all of that. Um, if we talk um, specifically or start by talking about where we are now in terms of drainage on UK farms, what, we, uh, what we're finding is that um, typically many of the drainage schemes that are out there are extremely old indeed and uh, have, have been put in many, many decades ago. So, uh, it's not uncommon for the drainage schemes that we're coming across to be installed in the 70s or even the 60s. So, that makes them about 50 to 60 years old as a minimum. More recently, it's uh, been probably and the extremes in weather that we're seeing. Uh, so, uh, if you look at the last few, uh, few years, we've got 2012, 2015, 2019. 2020 and 2023 more recently which have all been serious rainfall events and caused a lot of problems particularly when you consider the timing of the rainfall which has been in the autumn periods um, we also think that uh, bigger equipment bigger equipment on the uh, on UK farms has played its part in degrading some of the older schemes that have gone on um, and, and we are generally seeing now a situation where there is a realisation going on that a lot of those old schemes have failed. So, as you might expect, um, for us, our activity levels have increased dramatically on, on the back of that. And uh, we're now running four of these drainage teams, uh, so four trenching machines and all the ancillary kit that goes with it. And we also undertake all of the associated ditching works, culverts uh, and management. Um, we're a, we're a one-stop shop for land drainage and, and water management, so we undertake all of the survey and design work ourselves. So uh, when when we're first contacted, we use a bike and we um, do a detailed survey of the whole field. And we also piece together uh, ditch bed information using GPS and put together uh, a design that, that we can put in front of clients so that they can uh, assess it for themselves and work out if it's the right fit for them. What's, um, what's driving this change for demand? Um, we've heard this morning about subsidy removal and rising cost of production. Um, but there's also this steady realisation going on uh, that these old schemes are failing and farmers definitely have been taking more and more action to, to try and fight against that uh, in recent times. I think we had a lot of data this morning and that's particularly true in our line of work we're finding that yield data both before and after we've installed schemes is a particularly powerful tool in driving further demand for more drainage and and certainly we find once we go and work for a farmer and perhaps a field or two very quickly that they want to do some more because they can see uh, the, the huge difference that it makes um, so what are the benefits of land drainage well people talk a lot uh, about trying to quantify stuff and quite rightly so so Yield benefits is an obvious uplift. Um, we typically are seeing from data we're getting from our clients a 25 to 35% uplift in yield after we've been in and drained, uh, drained land. Typically all we're doing is replacing old schemes. There's not so much uh, work we're doing where we're, we're draining virgin land that's never been drained before these days. Um, so that's a fairly positive message to start off with. Um, I think what people think less about in terms of uh, drainage when we talk about it is, is also there's a cost reduction that goes on so when you create better soil conditions which are aerobic and have the right balance of moisture and air cavities when it to transport nutrients around and so on 
you can you can use uh, less seed rates at drilling stage. You can use less fertilizer. You need less chem chemical to go on to control things like black grass and so on. So there's a lot of benefits there as far as that's concerned as well. Um, furthermore, there's there's a lot of hidden benefits that sit with drainage which are not so easy to quantify. So particularly for someone like James, uh, who's doing a lot of block cropping and going from one farm to the next, don't want to be leaving fields. It's quite stressful from a management point of view. Don't want to be spending time pulling out stuck equipment in a wet autumn and so on. So how do you start to put a, a value on, the uh, on, on that side of it as far as drainage is concerned? Um, I'm, I'm at pains to point out that um, with the with the weather patterns we're seeing, there's been very narrow windows, particularly in the autumns recently, um, when there's been these very wet times, and quite often people are snatching a, a, a day or day or two here and there to get crops drilled or to get root crops harvested and so on. And we're commonly told that what we're doing is just speeding up that time so that people can get in far far sooner and, and make a difference with it all. Um, one of the things that I always like to tell people as well is that land drainage is one of the few investments that any farmer can make that works day and night, seven days a week, 365 days a year if it needs to, and it will just keep working. It needs very, very little maintenance, a little bit of jetting now and again, but that's it, and it will do, do its thing. And it, it's an investment that lasts for many, many decades. As we've just heard, um, 40 to 50 years is not uncommon for, for many farmers in terms of the way they view, view drainage. In terms of costs and affordability, um, for a 20 meter space scheme with gravel backfill to stay within to, uh, 12 inches of surface or 300 mil, which is a typical spec that we'd be putting in, you're looking at somewhere between three and 4,000 pounds a hectare to deliver it. Uh, so it is an expensive exercise. I'm at pains to point out that it is hugely variable based on the size of the scheme that's being done, the shapes of the field, soil types, time of year and everything else. It all it has quite a lot of determining what it's going to cost but it's really important to then consider that cost in terms of the lifetime of the scheme so whilst it's an initial big outlay it's then dividing that cost over the lifetime of the scheme which as I said is many many decades we're slowly starting to see a change in attitude towards drainage spend um, historically when I started 23 years ago doing this job uh, it was very much uh, an expense that people would look to do if they had some spare cash in the bank and they didn't view it as an asset in s perhaps the same way as a piece of machinery or something. Machinery is obviously very shiny, very tangible, something you can touch, something you can see and feel. Drainage is underneath the surface and perhaps less cool as a, an investment to be seeing uh, being made. One of the things I want to get across to you is that people increasingly that we're working with are viewing land drainage as something that they want to do uh, on a long-term basis, so they're approaching people like Oxbury, who we've heard from this morning, borrowing money to get it done, unlock the benefits, get the get those yields up, get those uh, improved profits back, and why wait? Why why hold off? How long does it take to work? Um, the minute we start putting in drains, if the soils are at field capacity, we'd expect to see them running almost straight away. Um, and they, as I say, they'll go on them working uh, on a consistent basis until all of the excess water is pulled out of the soil. Um, we do always stress to people that it's important that, um, that, that the farming practice that's going on top is still considered in a responsible way because you can still smear the top if you come on the, the ground too soon after it's been raining and so on, and you can cap it off over the top if, uh, if, if arable activities happen too quickly. But it is generally something that makes a huge difference in terms of the response time once um, rainfall uh, ceases. In terms of scheme payback, again, we've had a lot of data come in from existing clients and the schemes that we're putting in, glad, uh, we're, we're routinely told we're getting payback between three to five years. Climate change is something that's actually helping us in terms of um, making that point. And obviously, if you get a wet autumn and the scheme is a difference between getting all of your wheat area drilled or not, that's quite a significant factor and driving force behind many of the decision making that goes on. So I've just got four really quick uh, take home messages before um, before we start the actual demonstration. Um, my first is if you're thinking about drainage and you've got some wet land, 
why wait? What what are you what are you waiting for? What's 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 stopping you going out there and actually having a serious think about doing it and uh, and potentially getting some funding in place to to do it? You're going to be forgoing some yield if you've got land that's wet. Um, that can be quite a significant cost to you. You just can't see it because it's uh, it's something that you've never had or you haven't had in recent times. Be led by the data. We've got lots of yield data out there now. We've got satellites in the sky that are able to help determine decisions. There are lots of um, uh, people out there that have had drainage done. Speak to your neighbours who've had it done. Speak to people who who, who are familiar with it, and uh, you will you will find out the answers yourself in the same way that I can tell you. Um, consider using finance and don't play at it. If you uh, quite a lot of the time years ago, we'd have people come to us and say, "I want to drain part of a field," and then we'd come back and uh, a year or two later, and we'd drain a bit more because they then discovered that there was more needed. If you've got wetland, the data supporting it, get on and do it. And finally, I just wanted to say, if you're, if you're looking at drainage and you're serious about doing it, uh, it's a big investment, it's a big outlay, use a professional to get it done. There is quite a big art to getting the design right in the first place and understanding the way that a drainage scheme needs to go in. There is a right and a wrong way to align drainage schemes. There's a right and a wrong way for them to be spec'd up. And I've seen some really good examples of where people have tried to go it alone, save some money, and then ended, ended up costing themselves a lot of money in the process, which has all been quite painful. Um, people always like to talk to me about uh, the one simple question, which is, how am I going to fund it? And as I said, you can either go to, to the bank yourself or go to, to borrow some money. I like to try and turn that question around and I say, well, can you, in the year 2025, especially given what we've heard this morning, afford not to do it? Can you afford to be turning your back on two, two and a half tons a hectare of extra yield for the next 10, 20 years, which is the reality of what we're facing at the moment? There hasn't been so much drainage done since the grants finished in the 1980s, which is a long time ago now. And we saw that curve this morning in the talks about how UK agriculture has declined in its efficiency and productivity. Um, and maybe this is a, a, a great way, I know it's a great way of addressing that. So we're now gonna move to the actual demonstration itself. Um, we've got uh, a couple of Mastenbrook machines here. We've got uh, a Mastenbrook trencher and a Mastenbrook track gravel cart. The trencher is, um, uh, controlled by GPS which tells it where to drive in terms of uh, the alignment but it's also unusually controlling the Z variable which is the height at which the pipe goes into the ground so you can see the pipe going over the top of the machine and down through the pipe box and then the, the GPS is controlling that so that the pipe is going in at a constant grade as it moves across the field. The gravel hopper on the rear of the machine places the gravel directly over the pipe as it's laid and um, that means that there's no clay subsoils going in over the top of the pipe as we're, as we're going through the process. 